Thanks for tuning in. I'm Michael Watson, and this is the Influence Watch podcast. In this episode, radical environmentalists think shutting down the London underground is somehow a good idea. Demand Justice demonstrates that its idea of justice is just liberal politics. And we provide an update on major labor news. As UAW and GM reach a tentative deal, the Chicago Teachers Union strikes again, and the unions push for their wish list in Congress. Recall Sonny Bunch's law. Environmentalists make good movie villains because they want to make your real life worse. Today's example of this truism comes from London, where Extinction Rebellion, a faction of extremist environmentalists that engages in shutdowns of transportation infrastructure, decided to target the London Underground and the Docklands Light Railway. Yes, the very mass transit systems environmentalists say we all must use to get where we need to go. But the demonstrators' tactics were even worse than their target selection suggested. The tube disruptions targeted Canning Town Station, which serves the Canning Town District of East London, an area dominated by working-class public housing, what the Brits call council estates. So the posh, middle class in the British definition, which implies a higher socioeconomic status than the same term does in the U.S., brought environmental awareness to working-class commuters who were already not driving to work. Brilliant strategy there, guys. And that's not just me or other right-wingers saying that. London Mayor Sadiq Khan, a member of the Labour Party, the local Labour Party Member of Parliament, and the leadership of the often militant Rail Maritime and Transport Union all condemned Extinction Rebellion for disrupting public transportation services. Even an Extinction Rebellion spokesman admitted, quote, I am not sure, while speculating on whether the demonstration was a good idea. He further said that, quote, it is not our intention to target individuals or inconvenience hardworking people, which is, well, less plausible. Of course, Extinction Rebellion activists have explicitly admitted that their policy demands involve making life worse. Roger Hallam, an Extinction Rebellion co-founder, has been quoted saying, quote, you're going to have to be honest with the public and say, we are going to have a reduction in living standards. My colleague Ken Braun profiled Extinction Rebellion for CapitalResearch.org last month. And I commend his piece, Unabombers Without Bombs, to those seeking more information on the radical environmentalist group. Also demonstrating its radicalism this week was Demand Justice, a project of the left-wing 1630 Fund, the lobbying arm of the Arabella Advisors Network of Dark Money Groups my colleague Hayden Ludwig tracks for Capital Research Center, that focuses on advancing liberal judicial policy. Demand Justice released a list of 32 proposed nominees to the Supreme Court, and they were, in the words of the Wall Street Journal's James Freeman, left of Obama. You see, Demand Justice's list largely ignored the crop of liberal appellate judges the 44th president appointed to the nation's courts, instead choosing left-wing legal scholars and lawyers for activist groups. Only eight of the 32 named have any judicial experience. For what it's worth, of the current justices, all but Elena Kagan, who was the federal government's Supreme Court lawyer, the Solicitor General, before her nomination, were federal appellate judges. And of the 24 names remaining on President Donald Trump's lists of Supreme Court candidates, 23 are judges at the state or federal level. The right-leaning Daily Caller characterized the list as, quote, nearer to a progressive wish list than a serious short list for a Democratic president. Demand Justice said it hoped to prod a future Democratic president to, quote, approach the task of nominating judges with a new playbook, one that prioritizes unabashedly progressive lawyers and legal thinkers who have all too often been pushed aside. Which would be news to former American Civil Liberties Union Women's Rights Project General Counsel Ruth Bader Ginsburg and former Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund board member Sonia Sotomayor, both now justices of the Supreme Court with unabashedly left-wing records who had associations with left-wing advocacy groups in their careers. A list loaded with openly political advocacy lawyers fits the demand justice mode of politicizing the court system. The group has pushed court packing, expanding the number of Supreme Court justices for naked partisan advantage, a policy we noted that Justice Ginsburg, the notorious RBG herself, rejected in episode 81 of this podcast. And our final item this week is actually three items. It's been a big week in big labor news. First, the United Auto Workers and General Motors have reached a tentative agreement to end the 32-day strike against the company. The proposed deal would raise pay, give temporary workers permanent status after three years, and continue union members' generous health care setup. But three plants will be closed. But while the UAW is claiming victory, it cannot escape the cloud of the corruption scandal that has enveloped the union. The deal would shut down the GM Center for Human Resources, a joint labor management training center, much like the one at Fiat Chrysler, that has been implicated in a bribery and kickback scheme that has sent UAW and Fiat Chrysler executives to jail. 
Indeed, Arthur Schwartz, a labor consultant and former GM negotiator, told CNBC that he suspected, quote, the union may have been moving slowly because they had this cloud of corruption hanging over them. Union officers are meeting to determine if the strike will continue until the contract is ratified or whether the strike will end immediately. Second, the Chicago Teachers Union is on strike again, despite the school system offering raises and a three-year guarantee against health cost rises. The notoriously militant union walked out on Thursday, having struck for one day in 2016 and for seven days in 2012. According to the Illinois Policy Institute, conceding to the union's demands over salary, additional staffing, and new community schools could cost each Chicago taxpayer, property taxpayer, an additional $235 per year if the spending were fully funded by property tax. For good measure, median Chicago teacher salaries have outpaced the pay of the median Chicago worker. The ability of the radical Chicago Teachers Union to shut down public services and send 300,000 kids and families looking for alternative arrangements is a clear example of the power imbalance created by collective bargaining and legal strikes by government workers against taxpayers and citizens. A power imbalance that no less a friend of labor as Franklin Roosevelt recognized, once telling a Federal Employees Association, quote, the very nature and purposes of government make it impossible for administrative officials to represent fully or to bind the employer in mutual discussions with government employee organizations. Finally, the unions are making a push for their wish list bill, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, or the PRO Act. In case you missed it, the PRO Act is big labor's plan to bring the American economy back to the heady days of 1945-46, when the unions could just about shut down the American economy by striking. Back then, it got to the point that Friend of Labor, President Harry Truman, gave a national speech demanding that striking railroad men go back to work or he would draft them into the armed forces. The PRO Act would strengthen union power by repealing right-to-work laws, easing organizing by expanding card check, giving union organizers employees private contact information, and holding branding companies liable for independent franchise store owners' labor practices, and by removing restrictions on union strikes— most notably the ban on secondary strikes that target businesses not directly involved in labor disputes. The incentive for liberal politicians to advance the measure is obvious. Of the 10 most prolific organization contributors in the Open Secrets database since 1990, six are labor unions, and each gave over 96% of the associated contributions to liberals and Democrats. But just as important are the contributions, an estimated $1.6 billion over the past 10 years, that labor unions make to institutional progressive left organizations from their general treasuries. That is, from dues and in some circumstances, even forced agency fees. The PRO Act is ultimately about getting cash for advocacy and institution building from the union members and their families, union households and pollsters speak, who are far less monopartisan than the institutions that purport to represent them. While union households consistently vote only about 60-40 Democratic, their unions make contributions and institution-building expenditures that exceed 95-5% liberal or Democratic. That's our show for this week. If you're listening to this on YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. And if you have subscribed, thank you. And please leave us a five-star rating. We'll see you next week.